All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey guys, online, I got Matt Taibbi. How are you doing, dude? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, if you guys don't know, Matt's a great journalist and he runs racket.news. And he's got this great show that he does with uh, Walter Kern. And I always forget the name of the show. What's the name? America of the This Week. America This Week. Yeah, I was going to say something like that, but then I was going to flub it, so I'm glad I didn't. Um, America This Week. And by the way, who is Walter Kern? I like that guy. So you remember the movie Up in the Air uh, with George Clooney? Remind me. Mm, I'm not a big Clooney guy. It's uh, It was a movie about somebody who spends too much time on airplanes, and he's a, he's a, an efficiency consultant, and it's, it's, it's sort of a comedy about how depressing – corporate America is anyway Walter's a screenwriter and a novelist and cool uh, he used to be the editor that. of spy magazine which is um you know okay that was a, something I read religiously as a kid so we're, we're we're good pals that's cool okay well I'll head over to the pirate bay and download that that sounds interesting um mm -hmm. he's a very interesting guy and I've been you know watching your commentary as you know I tell everybody I get an email from Matt Taibbi. I stop what I'm doing and I read what you wrote. And sometimes it's the most crucial news in the world. And other times it's just really interesting opinion that I almost always agree with. And you've been really great on your election coverage, you and Walter both. Um, Walter, and, Walter more than me. He called a lot of this, actually. Yeah. yeah interestingly. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, but I mean... Well, anyway, I, there, there's so much to say about it, and you guys have had so much to say about it, but I guess I just want to ask you, like, in the most general way, like, what do you think about what happened? Well, this is more than an ordinary election. This is a, a, a massive uh, cultural shift in America because um, in addition to changing the, um, you know, the occupant of the White House, I think voters were really um, repudiating the mainstream media uh, when when the entire media calls somebody hitler um in unison for eight consecutive years and the population votes for that person <laughs> uh that tells you that they have no faith at all in um that sector of society no but that tells you that, that the american yeah. people are nazis or yeah or that i guess <laughs> right um but yeah, no, I, th I, I think this is the end of um, a long period where we've been um, living almost under a kind of cult-like uh, existence. And it, it hasn't been, we haven't been able to break it because of the informational dominance of, um, you know, the, the press and academia and, and politics. And that's now been essentially ousted. I think it's all going to evaporate, like all, all, all of these bizarre canceling behaviors, the moral panics. And I think it's all gone. Now, that's very hopeful. Uh, in fact, I think I saw, uh, I, I mean, I agree that there certainly has been a thumbs down given to that in a, in a huge way. But then I saw, I think it was a comment on your, on your website said, yeah, but the long march through the institution continues on. These people aren't just going to give up and go away. There's a huge no, bureaucracy true. and all the universities and all of the things. And it does, it is kind of apparent already though, isn't it? That like the resistance and all of that stuff, the way they tried to build it up back eight years ago, that's just not playing out. Trump's going to have his way, at least on the national government level. I don't know about us out in the culture, but even there, too, like, are they going to start putting boys in Star Wars again? Yeah, I mean, it might be stuff like that. I, and it won't just be based on, um, you know, the political aspect of it, right? Can we, can we have boys in Star Wars? It'll just be... Can we try to make a movie that makes money um, and, and not worry about anything else? And because they really haven't 
for a long time. There, the, there have been so many other considerations that have gone into everything. And this is true in journalism, too. Like it, the the news business, it, they stopped acting like um, sort of capitalist organizations about seven or eight years ago. So, for instance, C, uh, CNN, when they saw MSNBC make a mistake, they wouldn't jump on it if it was the, you know, mistake that might have helped Trump. Right. So you don't go beat up, beat up your competitor for political reasons, then you no longer have a free market. And that, that's kind of what we drifted away from. I, I, I think we're going back to what was more like normalcy before. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm really torn about this too, because, you know, the, the liberals are going to characterize it the way that they want it. If you voted against woke, if this is a, a cultural kind of reaction against all the wokeism and the cancel culture and all that, their phrase for that is, yeah, sexism and racism and what, you know, that whole thing. And then the typical answer, which I think is actually, you know, bared out in the exit polls and all that, was that this is really all just about price inflation and immigration because that's what everybody said it was about. And you don't really, it's sort of like with Biden being too old to be the president. Like you don't really have to know anything about anything to just look at him. Your Honor, you know what I mean? And the same kind of thing sure. with the price inflation. I saw this little old lady from the Bronx saying, a bell pepper is $5, and she started crying. How am I supposed to feed my grandbabies? And so, yeah, the incumbent doesn't win in a situation like that, and they printed too much money, man, and they were warned not to do it. And then so at the same time, though, like, man, I resent all this woke stuff so much, too, and all the cancellation and the censorship. And I've been censored, but even if I haven't, it, all the even just shadow banning some guy I've never heard of, it ain't fair to do that. And I hate the way it is, but then I fear, Matt, that actually that wasn't just rejected, that people really have accepted all that now and really don't care about that. It was just the bell peppers, man. No, I don't believe that because I think in addition to the, the issues that you talked about, it, there was the well there were there were really multiple aspects to it one yeah things are really tough out there it is really really hard to to get along if you don't make a ton of money and you know the inflation was a killer it was an indirect way of taxing essentially the poor for an, something that mainly helped the top straight of society but um in addition to that there were lies about it, right? So the, the economic news was massively suppressed. Uh, you saw, if you saw mention of it at all, you, it was in a column by somebody like Paul Krugman who told Americans that, um, you know, they were just mistaken. They had an impression that they were, that times were tough out there. Actually, the economy was great. And on top of that, there was this, you know, very condescending attitude that, um, this class of politician had when talking about uh, the economics of the country, they they came out and essentially said there is no such thing as economic anxiety. You're you're if you're voting for Trump, if you're voting for anybody except us, it's because you're a racist and you're a bigot, and all those things combine, I think, to to uh, result in a protest vote, right? So people have a lot of objections to Trump, but when you make people mad enough, they will do this. And I think the, it's all of the above, I think. Yeah. Well, I didn't vote for him because I just couldn't. My last vote was for Ron Paul in the primaries in 2012. And I can't, oh, I did vote against the sheriff a few years ago because he murdered a guy. So mm. that was important. But otherwise, right. I'm, I'm not much of a voter anymore. But and, and I couldn't bear to vote for Trump after what he did in Yemen and some other things back when he was in power the last time. But boy, was I rooting for him, Matt. And boy, did I almost vote for him. And you know what almost put me over the edge a few different times there toward the end was new charges in October oh, or superseding indictments or whatever, this kind of thing. Like, I don't even need to know the details. You're doing this on October the 15th? I'm upset. Like, no, you can't do that. It's so obviously cheating. And then the, I guess what you would consider white lies compared to major lies about policy but the lies about the bloodbath 
and the lies about no, the very the fine people. Liz Cheney it, thing. Yeah, you know, the Liz like, Cheney execution and Tony Hinchcliffe. I actually got to meet Tony Hinchcliffe because I was palling around with Dave Smith, and uh, I got to hang out with the guys in the back room there at the uh, mothership, and I got to meet the guy, and I've seen Kill Tony on the YouTubes there. And so what I know about him is he's not just a comedian. He's an insult comic, and I also know about him that I watched the set, and he made fun of lots of different people, not just Puerto Ricans. And then I had to read in the New York Times, man-made remarks against Puerto Rico. And I know it's so stupid, but that just drives me into a rage that they would treat me with such contempt as to talk to me that way about something that I already know better than that, you know? And I got to admit, or I got to... Um, hypothize, you know, expect that that's part of what drove people mad there. You know, when Donald Trump says there's going to be layoffs in the automotive industry and then they go, Donald Trump just threatened to murder half the population of the country if they don't vote for him. Right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and I think that incentivizes people to to push back and say, look, I'm just so tired of this. I'm tired of how insulting it is. Um, you know, this this idea that they we're supposed to vote on command um, because this group of people has decided that, you know, we can't, we can't handle even basic true information. So we're, we're going to not, we're going to shade things in a certain way. We're going to just outright hide uh, true facts from you and all for what reason so, so that you can be talked out of voting for Donald Trump like that's the thing that's so confounding about this like if they just played this straight I think they would have won um but they couldn't that's just not who they are they 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 need to condescend the people and and to um push them around and bully and that just doesn't fly in politics mm -hmm. so I don't know if you saw this on the Tucker show where um Paul Manafort seemed to claim to know that this was true from inside information or whatever, but it also seemed to sort of kind of at least be confirmed by Nancy Pelosi in her interview with the New York Times that the plan was not to run Harris. The plan was, as they had talked about, to do some kind of open process at the convention. And what happened was Biden said, well, if you're going to stab me in the back, I'm going to stab you in the front. So how do you like that? And he turned around and endorsed her. And made her, at that point, bulletproof in order to screw over everybody else because he knew that she was so weak. But that also, once he endorsed her, there's no way they could overthrow her for a white man now. And so now they would just be stuck with her. And that's why he's so happy now when he's giving a speech or hanging out with Donald Trump. You can see how thrilled he is. And, and he's not resentful. He's not like, I would have won. He's like, ha ha, I told you I would have won and you couldn't. You know what I mean? He's, he's just happy about it. But I wonder whether you think that that's really him. right, that he that he announced his endorsement of her as not part of the plan that they had all come up with, but in order to sabotage the plan that they had all come up with. Hmm. Um, look, that, that's hilarious if that's true. Uh, <laughs> it, it's still amazing how little we know about how that whole thing came about. Yeah. We had... You know, we had reporting by um, by Cy Hirsch uh, suggesting one thing. We 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 had the uh, quasi official version, which came from people close to Nancy Pelosi and Nancy Pelosi herself, right? And that was the one in which um, Pelosi went to Biden and showed him polls that suggested he was going to be, you know, uh, lose by. 400 electoral votes right that trump was going to get that many and this was what uh, encouraged him to step down but they never really gave us anything about uh what the process was like how did they get from biden dropping out of the race to harris becoming the nominee uh we have almost no information about that and i think that's amazing don't you <laughs> i mean i do Seems like a, a more more than a minor issue to me. Yeah, know. seriously. And then, you know, because he's such a stubborn guy. I don't want to say proud because that can't be right, but <laughs> he's such a stubborn guy. Like, you could see how, you know, because they really screwed him over, uh, Obama particularly. You know, he, he must have made some kind of weird deal with Hillary Clinton that he promised to support her over Biden in 16 and Biden had to take the back seat and blame it on his dead son and all this stuff. And then she lost. 
And he was mm-hmm. like, see? You know, so now this is to him like his big vindication. And it's just funny also, too, that, you know, not just to see, like, how happy he is that she lost and how vindicated that makes him, which is apparently what he's so excited about. But also, he was the guy that said that Donald Trump's going to destroy democracy forever, right? Like, if, if you ever read, like, uh, The Rise and— Oh, you guys were talking about this on your show the other day. You read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Like, there are all these opportunities where Hindenburg could have killed Hitler, and one time he actually did bring his pistol, and he was going to kill Hitler, and then he chickened out and he didn't do it. And then, like, that's what their— their kind of narrative here is that this is this is why you have to vote Democrat, even if you hate everything we've done to you, that you can't let America go full fascism. We might never have another election again. And then Joe Biden's like, hey, Don, good to see you, buddy, and just welcomes him. We're going to do everything we can to make the easiest transition of power for you, my friend. Like, what is going on here, dude? They don't even care that we're watching this and remember last week, you know? I'll I'll be shocked if photos don't surface of them like uh, you know at a topless bar or water skiing together. I mean <laughs> right. it's it's it's, uh, it's such a bromance at this point, and um, it, it you know if if that explanation is true that that he foisted uh, Harris on the party uh, in an act of spite, that is hilarious, and and this uh, sort of postscript to the whole thing is even funnier. So. Yeah. Yeah, oh, totally. Is. It. Isn't it great? It's so weird. And then here's the thing, too. Isn't Kamala Harris terrible and weird? Wasn't that the weirdest thing to try to make that normal? And isn't it weird that it worked and that tens of millions of people apparently turned out to support her? Including, like, people on my street that got Madam President on their yard signs, Matt. They yeah, believed I, I in that. I know. I know. And well, they were con- even stranger was that they were convinced instantaneously uh, that she was a good candidate. And, th- and this I know was bogus because I covered her uh, presidential run in 2020 and, you know, watched as, uh, you know, people in Iowa you know, and Iowans are they're, they're great crowds. Right. Like if, you, if you've got anything to give them, they're interested, you know, um, mm-hmm. If, if you're funny, they they want they want you to bring out your funniness. If you've got, uh, you know, a sort of interesting, uh, sort of non-conventional vision like Marianne Williamson, they want you to t- tell them about that. They just didn't have anything. They, they were not interested in Kamala at all. Like she was the biggest bomb in Iowa that I can remember, and anybody who saw that performance had to know that she was not going to do well. Um, in a national election. Now, she actually out, massively outperformed my ex- expectations um, in terms of she appeared on TV, but still, uh, yeah. it, was, it was wild that they thought that that was going to work. Yeah, and then to hear them now, they go, well, look, we know, everybody knows, like it's Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. Listen, we know that she ran a perfect campaign. Therefore, it has to be that people just hate blacks and women. Right. Yes, exactly. That's the only possible explanation. But what, what's different about this race as opposed to 2016 when they instantaneously all came out with, well, you know, we live in a white supremacist nation. That's the explanation. Um, this time, the, the, there were, the, you know, the, um, the coalition for Trump was varied enough that they had to blame all kinds of people. They had to blame white women. They had they had to blame Hispanic men. They had to blame black men. They had to blame um, uh, sort of black uh, blacks and Hispanics not getting along. I mean, I've seen almost every iteration of who was to blame for this. Every, almost every racial category uh, was blamed for being for having some kind of um, uh, bigoted take that led to this election. So it, it wasn't just white people this time around. That was interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, blacks and Mexicans have always been the worst white supremacists, and white women are definitely the worst sexists. So this is all sounds right to me. I mean, the the fact that they that there were many people talking about how, uh, you know, we white women didn't turn out for Kamala Harris. I, I I just don't know how you can take that 
point of view seriously looking at the results but anyway mm -hmm. uh, well you know it, and this is it's almost not their fault because it's just damn them who they are but they always just talk about well the non-college educated white women as compared to the college educated ones because the college educated ones are the smart ones see not like the dumb ones when they don't even realize what they're talking about is people who can afford a bell pepper versus people who no longer can that's what right. we're talking about people who right. it really matters when the price of groceries doubles or you know goes up 30 40 50 percent and other people who go geez that sucks but then whatever or they don't even notice because they're you know uh butler or nanny or whatever did their shopping for them and then it's none of their concern whatsoever how much the eggs cost and in fact by the way did you see morning joe oh did i get this from you where morning joe said what butter costs seven dollars? What is it laced in gold or something? Because he had no, <laughs> no idea about that, price inflation. That, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, no, that's yeah. typical of them, though, right? Yeah, oh, uh, totally. Well, it's a Bindi Brzezinski's daughter, for Christ's sake. Like the guy whose fault all of this is, and she's the one who gets to tell us what's true and false. Just like they got Alan Greenspan's wife up there telling us about the boom and the bus cycle. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna I, hurdle I myself I off mean, of something. If people knew how literally in intermarried Washington was, um, I, th I think they would be freaked out. I mean, people, you know, Dana Bash was a big player in this election. Mm -hmm. uh, how many, you know, I wonder how many people know that her husband is like the chief of staff for John Brennan um, or was, right? Like if you call John Brennan's phone, like that's the guy who answers. Wow, uh, I did um, not know that. I knew that he had been a war contractor previously. Yeah, he's but, he's a former CIA chief of staff. God, he, Jeremy oh Bash. man, I'm so far behind on everything. Holy crap! But there, I did there's not like know a million that. things like that where you're like, wow, um, how do, how does that work? <laughs> did, they, did they have uh, did they have sort of no fly zones about what they do can and cannot talk about at yeah. night? I, mean, I don't know. That's, yeah, they that's they never disclose their conflicts of interest. I mean, they you know remember it was a huge deal when. What's his name? Oliver at the uh, New York Times did that final thing at the end after it was all over about how Rumsfeld's generals had controlled the media, you know, a bunch of retired generals, but they would get briefings from Rumsfeld every day on what they were supposed to say and how they were all on the dole, every one of them. And like the most obvious one is Barry McCaffrey, the war criminal oh, right. of the highways of death of 1991, was the same guy who he's just selling Bradley fighting vehicles. He's on the board of directors of the thing, and then he's going on TV and he's going, "What the army needs right now is Bradleys." And like, is this a like a Sunday morning infomercial, or what am I actually even watching here? You know? Well, it's more it's more like that Kelsey Grammer uh, quasi comedy a movie about about Pentagon contracting, right? right? I mean, Pentagon uh, Wars. Yeah, Pentagon Wars. It has uh, Robin Hood men in tights is in that too. I never know that guy's name, but. Oh, Carrie Elwes, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, look, everybody's um going nuts about this new defense secretary, and I don't, I don't know the guy, so I can't comment on that. But I, but what I can say is, like, really, how many Raytheon executives, you know, do we really need uh, in the Pentagon? Do we? Is, is it absolutely necessary that we get another one? I mean, <laughs> yeah. maybe it's time for some other kind of idea. Um, well, they should have got Dan McAdams from the Ron Paul Institute instead of this kook. But still, I take your point that like, yeah. yeah, what they consider to be the staid centrist experts we can rely on are actually a bunch of lunatics who get everything wrong over and over again. Right. And, and that's 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 the problem with this whole thing. It's like the, the these people who complain about the, you know, undermining trust in the mainstream press. Well, yeah, that would be a problem if you guys didn't mess literally everything up. I mean, right. <laughs> you you make mistakes about everything. I mean, every conceivable major story is is, is bungled, and then you don't fix it by going back and and talking about it. Um, I, it's going to be interesting, by the way, if there and I know uh, that there are people in the transition team who are thinking about this, about doing you know something like a a Nuremberg style, not a series of trials, but a series of investigations into, um, you know, what went, what went wrong in things like COVID, um, Russiagate, uh, in, with the censorship business, 
there are going to be lots of eyes on documents that um, are going to be very interesting, and they're they're going to get out too. Mm-hmm. That which is going to be great. Yeah, that's a big deal. You know, um, I believe through your recommendation, I started following Undead Foya on mm-hmm. Substack, and. He put out a thing yesterday, some documents I'd like to see declassified. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, I don't know. I, I'm tired of getting my uh, I'm, I'm already over getting my hopes up at all after the recent cabinet picks. But wait, I want to pick on Kamala Harris more still. Um, sure. It, that perfect campaign that she ran. I know it wasn't just me because I was barely paying attention, man. I'm writing a book. Um, I, I know everyone else noticed that they didn't put her out there for six weeks, right? They had oh, her okay. give a, a few canned speeches, but it was really six weeks went by before she sat down for an interview. And, I mean, the body language there is just inescapable, right, of abject cowardice, and 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 it, they might as well have admitted in plain English, she's not ready. We have to train her like a seal and see if we can get her to repeat some things. It's going to take us six weeks to see if we can get her to say too many Gazans are being killed instead of anything of substance, right? And then, and and that was it. It took six weeks, and then what did they come up with? Nothing. They came up, they they all call her word salad or whatever because she can never finish a sentence. She never, she's always trying to ad-lib it. She's always acting like she's going to think of something. She's going to come up with a way to finish this sentence, but it never quite comes to her, and she just kind of gives up in defeat. Yeah, she 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 does a lot of stringing sentences along by thinking of synonyms, which are like words that mean the same thing <laughs> as other words. Like she she does that a lot because what she's she's pausing, right? Um, which is a problem, but uh, she also had a problem previously with reading prepared text, and they did fix that pretty well, I thought. Like you know, on the campaign trail in twenty twenty, she had this terrible issue where she would um uh, while she was reading speeches she would sometimes kind of put a a hand on on a hip and tilt her head sideways and kind of look at the audience as though she were pissed off at it um and there was this body language delivery that that was really bad uh and she eliminated a lot of that stuff and and did much more traditional um, you know, political oratory, which was effective through the through the uh, convention, but yeah, man, once she started getting into those interviews, it fell apart pretty quickly. Yeah, and then you know, I read in the Financial Times this morning that well, you know, the reason she didn't go on the Rogan show was they had talked about it and they decided that uh, they were worried it would turn off the progressives. If they went, well, doesn't away. that just tell you everything that you need to know about how useless the Democratic Party is? Um, I mean, first of all, let's just talk about the fact that the the Donald Trump interview on Joe Rogan it got forty seven million views on YouTube alone, and from what I understand, it was more like a hundred million views when you figured in all the other media. So. This is a, a show that has probably 50x the, the impact of the biggest cable shows on TV. So, uh, and <clears throat> these are male voters. So Joe's audience is like 81% male. Uh, they are divided almost into almost perfect thirds in terms of independents, um, re- Republicans, and uh, Democrats. So the strike zone of male independent to um, unconvinced Republican voters, which was exactly what she needed to reach to win the battleground states, she had a chance to talk to 100 million of them and bailed on it because a bunch of idiots in her, in her campaign objected to the fact that Joe once upon a time said that trans women or trans men sh- shouldn't fight chicks or something like that. Um, so uh, this again gets back to this idea of, are we trying to win an election or are we trying to win some, you know, stupid, who's the wokest person in our organization contest, right? It's, Mm. you know, you would never have seen that kind of behavior in 1994 
when it was important to reach as many people as possible. They just, there's a lot of people in politics now who don't think politics is about reaching the most people. And, and, that, and that was the ultimate example of that. Hang on just one second for me here. You guys, I'm so proud to announce the publication of the Libertarian Institute's 14th book. It's Israel, winner of the 2003 Iraq oil war. Undue Influence, Deceptions, and the Neocon Energy Agenda by Gary Vogler, former senior oil consultant and deputy senior oil advisor for U.S. forces during Iraq War II. Remember how I wrote in Enough Already about how Ahmed Chalabi sold the neoconservatives on a plan to rebuild the old British oil pipeline from Mosul and Kirkuk, Iraq to Haifa, Israel, if they would only get the United States to overthrow Saddam Hussein for him? And how they bought it, because they are as dumb as they are corrupt? Well, Gary was there. As senior civilian consultant to the DOD and Iraqi oil ministry, he had a unique window and experience witnessing the Pentagon neocons and their machinations on behalf of Israel before and during that war. And it turns out that even though they did not get their pipeline, as Vogler demonstrates, the neocons and their Likudnik bosses figured out an effective plan B anyway. You are going to love Israel, winner of the 2003 Iraq Oil War by Gary Vogler, available everywhere. Check it out along with our other great books at libertarianinstitute.org slash books. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. Nobody trusts the U.S. dollar anymore. Foreign governments are stocking up on gold instead of $100 bills. One, they know they need to. And two, that means you need to, too. Interest rates are up, but for some reason, not much for savings accounts. Park your money there and watch Uncle Joe Biden just counterfeit its value away. You can see how the Fed is afraid to raise rates to beat inflation for fear of popping the current bubbles, at least before the election. So more inflation it will continue to be. Gold is your shield against monetary and price inflation, just like it always has been. Now Tim Fry and the guys over at Roberts & Roberts are recommending gold over silver since the world's almost 200 governments are putting their own pressure on the price, which should help everyone else who makes similar calls on their own. Of course, Roberts & Roberts can help you with platinum, palladium, and silver as well as gold. Don't let the Fed and the war party inflate all your savings away. Look up Roberts & Roberts at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. Yeah, I mean, even Hillary Clinton went on Fox News, didn't she? She's not afraid to talk to Republicans. Well, even even Kamala went on Fox News. Yeah. And look, and, and, and you know what they say in the Financial Times article? They go, well, you know, because he was going to really go after her. And then I guess I saw something else that, like, Oh, he was joking around on his show that they made him promise that he was going to not ask her about pot. And it's like, I mean, that's part of the whole thing is that you're so phony. You can't just grapple with the thing. Look, my job was prosecuting people. And yeah, I smoked some. And that is kind of fucked up. But like, I don't know. I came up with something to say about it. Just say something. But like, no, you're not allowed to ask me about that. That was one of their strictures that they tried to do. But then Rogan had made himself so clear on different shows, and because I saw this on YouTube, people were making shorts out of it on YouTube, of Rogan saying, I just want to shoot the shit with her. I just want to talk to her. I just want to get to know her, which was also very revealing that he he kept saying, who are you? Like, as though he was already talking to her, like, first person thing, like, who are you, lady? Who the F are you? I want to know. And But he wasn't being mean. He was like, I don't want to badger her. I just want to, like, coax her into being herself and talking to me that was all he was asking for and you, you know he's an honest guy and as you know he was like a bernie guy he's not a right winger as he put it the other day i think that they judge him by his appearance right because he's got upper body strength they think he's a right winger but no he's a bernie guy he's from san francisco or something like that it's somewhere no, he, in california originally Boston. Yeah, he, he, he and i have um yeah he, he's a comedian from from boston um, we actually, uh, cross paths, although we never talked to each other back then, but, um, yeah, no, he came, he came up through Boston comedy clubs. He, he was a, uh, a, a bouncer at a casino, uh, in, in Southern mass or Rhode Island. I'm sorry. And, um, but he, he's not mean. And I've been on his show a bunch of times and, I think what they were afraid of in the Harris campaign is what everybody who goes on that show experiences, which is that 
look, he's curious. He's going to ask you curveball questions that have nothing to do with anything you've ever written about or talked about on television. And you are going to find yourself um, in a live setting uh, or close to live setting, uh, just sort of talking out your ass about things. And people are going to learn about who you are, uh, you know, what your personality is like, how you respond to certain kinds of jokes and all these other things. It comes out over three hours. And uh, if you're, there's nothing there, if you have no personality, the Rogan show is the worst possible format for you. And I think that's what they were worried about. Of course. And that's the thing is, just like with Biden being too old. Like, Well, that's what everyone concluded from her not doing it right i mean if you're just the diehardest come all of him maybe you say well he was going to be mean to her and try to rationalize that or whatever but for anyone else like that's obviously what it is donald trump the way he said he goes oh come on she'd be laying in there on the floor curled up in a coma or something because because why and he was right because rogan i don't know who brought it up but somebody's like hey what do you think about the windmills and the whales oh i think three things about it here they are in no particular order like yeah she could not do that she no, could not do that he goes and and you know trump has an advantage here that this isn't necessarily fair to her but it goes to show like the ease that trump was at or in or what he wasn't nervous to go up there and when they start talking about boxing and and uh mma stuff He's right at home because, you know, he had helped sponsor some of that back in the day and um, at his casinos and whatever. And so they're talking about, oh, you like oh, that yeah. one fighter? Me, yeah, me too. Remember that one time he fought that one guy? Yeah, that was great. And boy, she couldn't talk like that about any subject. Maybe cooking or something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, he's got a huge advantage there, right? I mean, I, I, I remember seeing Donald Trump sitting, I think, next to Muhammad Ali at a Tyson fight, the 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 tyson biggs fight um at the trump casino uh so he's you know he's right in the strike zone of the things that joe rogan cares most about right True. um but like you, you know. said when when rogan throws him a total curveball and goes oh let's talk about this now he's fine and 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 vice versa too when Ro when trump goes off on some tangent you know they're just but it's free form and, and as you say with every what they had every reason to be terrified of Putting her in front. She would have run out of things to say in absolutely no time flat. Oh, that reminds me of another thing I want to ask you about. And I had read this. I can't remember the article anymore, but it was like they had named it Ara or Sarah or some kind of thing. And it was the computer program that was supposed that Robbie Mook had hired to run the campaign for him during uh, Clinton 16. And how these guys had the same problem with his absolute... Oh, this might have even been an article in the New York Times I read, an opinion piece in the New York Times. So this vast over-reliance on this specific kind of data analytics that just tries to you know, profile every voter or the voters on this street or this block and tailor, you know, have essentially like the computer spit out on a piece of paper exactly what you're supposed to say to push all their exact buttons to get them to do what you want. And and the guy in the, writing in the New York Times, he said, this would be like turning your entire hospital over to the radiology department. Like, you guys have a role to play with your x-rays and scannings and things like that. But, like, there are other doctors who know about other stuff here, too. And now, But they have just totally gotten, you know, these are the believe the science people. Where they're, like, what it really means is they they seed their thinking to a computer. Because they think it's smarter than a human. And that it will know what to do when they don't know what to do. So they ask it what to do. And then it doesn't know what to do. It says, you should go out there and you should say... Too many Gazans are dying. But that's all. You shouldn't say who's killing them. You shouldn't acknowledge that. You're the one killing them. You shouldn't say what you're going to do about it. You sure as hell shouldn't say who is actually dropping the bombs on their head or what the fight is. You should just say that. And then that makes sense from the computer program's point of view. And I guess the guy reading the receipt, it spits out. But for the audience, boy, it just falls so short. You know what I mean? Oh Why did I change just... my mind on fracking? Because that's the thing I do sometimes. I don't know. And this is the thing that people never got about 2016, too, is that there were, I don't know, there must have been metric tons of these stories about how Donald Trump is is fake and, 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 and that he lies. But on the stump, 
he, he may be lying factually about things, but he's very genuine on the stump. In other words, the, the Trump, the human being, is very accessible to the person in the crowd. Uh, and that is very important in campaigning. Now, he may be saying something completely untrue. He may be misremembering. He may be intentionally lying. He may be making a promise that he's not going to keep. I mean, all these things are true, but you get a sense of the person and what he's like. And it's a very human thing and it's powerful. And if you, if you try to engineer this with can statements you know which is what they did in the pre-trump era is they just sent, sent people out there and had them you know read out lists of dial survey words that shit doesn't work it, it just it, it, it people do not respond to it where they whereas they do respond to the other thing yeah um yeah exactly and like you know it's a george carlin thing about william uh, about bill clinton he goes, Bill Clinton comes right out there and he goes, hey, I'm Bill Clinton and I'm completely full of shit. And right. people go, hey, at least he's honest. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's, there is a lot to that. I mean, no, nobody had any illusions about Donald Trump. I mean, very, maybe a few people did. I don't know. But, uh, but when, you know, Harris comes out there and she – she tells these stories about herself that are oddly nonspecific. We, we hear a lot about her background as a prosecutor, but we never hear anything about the cases. We never see video of her in court. Um, we, we never see transcripts of her arguing in court. Uh, we just don't know a lot about this person. There's, she's kind of a cipher, right? And it's, it's one thing to get all, all the way to, I don't know, maybe a primary uh, as a candidate like that, but to be the nominee uh, and have nothing that people can sink their teeth into uh, in terms of, I don't know who this person is. Um, it's just incredible. Uh, yeah. Well, and look, I mean, it's a Senate full of Kamala Harris's too. They're all like, oh, that, yes. basically, you know, you get yes. occasionally a guy like, I don't know, Mike Lee, or uh, I'm sure there are some on the Democrat side. I don't mean to be partisan about it, but just, People who do read books and like are generally interested in public policy, but some of them are not. Like you could, she's just not. If you said to her, "Hey, man, what, did you see the thing about the whales and the in the uh, windmills there?" She'd be like, "No," <laughs> you know. She didn't uh, see it because she she because look, nobody was reading looking for that story, right? You just come upon that when you're reading the Wall Street Journal in the morning. You go, oh, right. there's a thing about the whales in there. Or, you know what I mean? Or, like, you're you're listening to NPR radio on the way to work, and they go, oh, here's a story about whales. But, but like, you would have to be somewhat interested in news about things going on in the world to sort of accidentally have heard that that's a controversy. Did you hear that there's a thing about that? And, like, I don't know all about it, but I heard that there's a thing about that. You know what I mean? She never even heard that there's a thing about that or anything else. She's just not even the kind of person who cares. She's the kind of person who comes home and watches TV, like, uh, you know, uh, dramas and sitcoms and things. She doesn't stay at late reading. And, and, you know? and she also just doesn't come across as somebody who lo who enjoys – just hanging out with lots of different types of people, you know. Um, there are some people, some crowds in, in which she seems a little bit comfortable, uh, but for the most part, it, she looks just desperate to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, that that's something that people pick up on is that, you know, maybe you don't, maybe she doesn't know about the whales, but the, a, a normal person who doesn't know um, would say, oh, what's that? Tell me about it. Then, you know, let's, let's, let's discuss. She right. can't do that. that. That is a frightening prospect for her. And it, it just doesn't work in the national level. Yeah. It's just amazing that that was who they tried to run, whether it was Biden that did it to him or whatever. Either way, the thing was hilarious. And it is also hilarious the way that, you know, I regret this because I hate making predictions because, as Yogi Berra said, it's really dangerous to make predictions, especially about the future, um, because, you know, you could get it wrong and then look dumb. And, and all the polls say it's neck and neck, and I'm rationalizing that like, look, I mean, I know that his negatives are high, but see, this is the way I rationalized the Romney-Obama thing in 12, was a lot of people hate Obama. 
But a lot of people really love Obama. But nobody loves Mitt Romney. And that's right. your margin right there, dude. Right? Like, mm-hmm. the, he's just safe and coming. I barely even covered that election because I was like, Obama's going to win. Forget it. Let's get back to talking about the war. And, like, you know what I mean? That was just, it didn't even matter. It was so obvious. And it was the same I, kind I actually of thing. got in trouble for saying on television uh, early in that race that um, all the dramas in the Obama Romney election were being invented uh, because everybody in, all campaign journalists knew who was going to win. Um, <laughs> and I said this on CNN uh, like six months before the election. <laughs> They're and, like, Tybee, uh, you're going to get us laid off, dude. Be quiet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're pretending there's a thing here. Um, and so this one was the same way. It said that she's sort of kind of in the chair already, right? And he's the challenger. So that does change it a bit. But, you know, and then, you know, obviously the feeling is with obviously the, the inflation and immigration, both of those work in his favor. And the polls said, you know, for a year straight or more before that, that those are the top two issues. And right. and he's, you know, he's not very good on uh, printing money himself, but he's definitely takes the popular position on immigration right now and um, and just not being the guy in charge right now while prices are through the roof and all that. So it was his to lose, but man, he clobbered her, right? I mean, they won, he won all seven swing states, but then it's interesting though, cause it's still by pretty thin margins in those states or not. I really don't know the real details of that stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't know either. Um, but I, I do know that you know, I'm working on a story right now about um, how one of the major polling aggregators, the real clear, uh, politics polling ag- ag- average, which is what all campaign reporters dating back to 2002 have always used. Uh, it's just a bunch of numbers, um, but it was suppressed on Wikipedia uh, because it was judged to be too friendly to Trump. It turned out to be the most accurate poll uh, by far, uh, but uh, it was de- it, it was penalized for not weighting certain things above others. And, you know, that tells you another again about the kind of landscape we live in where we think we might be live, looking at raw information, but we're actually seeing like an artificial uh, version of it. And uh, so some of the polling was probably more definitive behind the scenes, is I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. Yeah, that was they always talk about that. Right. Oh, our internal polls say this. Well, how come you don't tell us that? And honestly, I. I I would have been looking at real clear politics if I was trying to keep up on the daily basis like that. And certainly, you know, that night of the election, we were doing a live stream goofing around. And that was what I had pulled up on the screen was Mm -hmm. real clear politics. Mm -hmm. That is like they're the definitive uh, source on that. But that's interesting to hear about their polling there. And I guess it's really it's not necessarily what the polls say at real clear politics or here there. It's what the rest of the media choose to highlight about the polls or which polls they talk about because right. they would always just say oh it's neck and neck and it's 50 50 and it's got to be and i just man i i uh, i was not surprised to see her lose i was going to be surprised if she was able to pull it out but then again yeah. i mean i am surprised how many people did vote for her and again i can understand why people be against trump but boy sure. i don't know showing up for that though really man yeah well you know i mean it's, there are also social factors too. Don't don't forget about that. That's a powerful thing. Like you know, if you if you don't vote uh, to stop Hitler, you know. Yeah. And, well, you, you know, know what? That's an important thing too, right? Is we always kind of maybe even just kind of pick on. We think of like the powerful liars pushing these narratives, but the real point is, or a real point is that there are a lot of regular people out in the country who are made to feel really afraid. And, like, I would hate to, like, have to say, like, black women, I'm sorry, but this isn't really about you at all, right? Like, I I know that they keep saying it is, but this wasn't the election about whether you like black women or not. That was not the issue. And and they keep telling you that and want to make you feel like, oh, now, yeah, this is because America hates you or whatever. No, it's not. America doesn't hate you. But we weren't voting for or against someone because of that detail either or those traits you know that was not the issue of the election at all and but i'm sure there's a lot of 
you know, probably especially little girls or whatever who've been made to feel like, oh, you're supposed to put all your hopes and dreams into this. And then now it's all destroyed because it turns out America hates people like you. And it's like, dude, that's totally not true. That's a bunch of self-justifying garbage, you know. And I know. Um, But I, a I lot know. of people are the victims of that kind of thing, too. I saw some guy kill his family. He's freaking out during the thing, during the election returns. Really, because, where was that? I, 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 I saw an, uh, one murder story in Seattle that looked horrible. I, yeah, but, I think that was it. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I think that might. I think that was the one. But, and there, but there's, you know, people talking about, oh, they hate their family. They never see them again. I saw one where this black woman was crying and saying, and, and like, I don't know, if she's just acting for her TikTok or whatever. Like, who knows? But like, she was saying, I really don't know if I'm gonna wake up and be a slave again tomorrow. And it's just like, look, man, like. Dude, you got to get out of your bubble. You're in a media silo. You should read my man Taibbi's book, Hate Inc. <laughs> but like, yeah, no, you and but I can understand though how people get inside a small enough echo chamber, a bubble of of uh, you know, pair of glasses of way to look at this thing that like they could really be led to believe that that was what this election was about. The white supreme even as you said, blacks and Mexicans are voting for Trump more than ever, but whatever. Um it's it's the white supremacist versus the people like you and 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 what a terrible narrative what a what a cynical way to try to run a political campaign and a and and a political movement the the american liberal left they're they're mean it, man it, it it it's a it's a kind of racism that's really de depressing i mean look there's there's racism on, on in both camps undeniably right um but the the kind that's been promulgated by uh, not even so much the left, but as the Democratic Party, which has made everything about race, made everybody intensely conscious about race all the time, right? And so I think as a country, we had come to a place where this was, it was starting to not mean so much, you know? Um, Agreed. And everywhere from the military to corporate America, it was becoming normal for, for people to interact and not think about it <laughs> that much. And then suddenly we entered this period where it became about everything. And I think it set us back um, significantly. And that actually is something that is not going to go away quickly. I think that the damage from that era from this era in terms of racial relations in this country is, is significant. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that, um, how, how quickly it's going to be resolved. Yeah. And especially look, I mean, they inflated so much. It's not just the price inflation on the shelves. There's major asset bubbles in different areas and things, and we could have a major crash coming. The only way to prevent that would be to slash regulation so much that productivity is just absolutely unleashed and counteracts the, you know, the comeuppance, the gap between the amount of money they created and the amount of real wealth that it's supposed to represent, you know. And so, the, I mean, imagine we had a 2008 type thing coming soon, you know, at the oh, dawn yeah. of the new Trump era something like that how how much more divide because that's what all this culture war crap is about it always has been it's so that the left and the right don't unite and crucify the bankers again to paraphrase storage carlin there of course i mean the, the and this is a major test for the for the trump campaign because uh you know the, the root causes the that that drove his popularity in the beginning i i mean i I think about this in terms of my career. I started writing in after 2008 about how we created a two-tiered economy with two sets of rules: the 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 rich idiots who caused the 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 mortgage bubble to explode, with you know a gazillion different cons. They all got bailed out. Uh, they were made immune to market consequence, and the rest of everybody else had to actually eat the losses. And, you know, they, they had the heaviest dose of capitalism. They had the full free market experience, right? Um, and so that's the beginning of the, you know, the system is rigged thing that Trump talked about and Bernie talked about, by yeah. the way, in, in 2016. It was rigged. We well, had go back to early economy. Obama. It was Occupy Wall Street on one side and the Tea Party on the other. And both of them were saying, 
to various degrees, but they were trying to emphasize economic issues and not divisive cultural issues. Hey, guys, they're going to try to use cultural issues to divide us, so let's just leave abortion and immigration out for a minute, and let's just talk about bank bailouts. And that was the emergency. So then they started going, oh, yeah, well, you got white privilege, and you're gayer than that guy, and this and that and whatever, yeah. and get everybody fight. That's when that's when you know when Bernie was drawing blood against Hillary and, uh, over this stuff in in 2016. That's when she broke out the whole, you know, if we broke up the banks now, would that end racism? That it was, I absolutely believe that was the reason that they started using you know, leaning into the identity politics. It was the way out of criticism on the economic stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely was, and then people react so badly. It's um. You know, South Park had that great thing about like the science of trolling and just getting oh, people, God, yes. yeah. one yeah. guy getting other people to fight and how it just takes off from there. And mm -hmm. it's just the perfect mm -hmm. thing. You know, yeah. you mentioned before about troll trace. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, in, in another context, you mentioned about how Rogan got in trouble because he was talking about men fighting women or i guess a specific man who was fighting in the mma so it wasn't just talking about like a race and like stealing a trophy but like actually beating the hell out of some lady and that was what he got in trouble for was crossing the line on what you're allowed to think about something that would be in any other context the most obvious conclusion in the world because you're not even just talking about a man fighting a woman. You're talking about a MMA fighter. And she might be an MMA fighter too, but still, you know? I don't know. I, I know. I know. And and the fact that people were looking over their shoulders, were wondering if they could, you know, make an obvious observation <laughs> tells you how crazy this period was. Yeah. So, All right. Hey, yeah. I got to let you go. And I know you got to go, but real quick. You you did mention there about there's a future here in document releases and especially, I hope, on the censorship regime because yeah. this has got to be like a real last stand, major fight, and right from the beginning here of, of if it's at all possible for free speech forces to harness the momentum behind the new Trump administration and completely smash that censorship enterprise that you, sir, have documented to such an incredible degree there at racket.news. And so what do you know about those efforts or what could people do to help or, or anything like that? Um, help, nothing yet, but I can tell you absolutely that the transition team is uh, marshalling a lot of resources to um, uh, taking on that problem and also just the intelligence community generally. Um, I don't know if that extends to the entire transition team, um, but they are they are looking for people to do a, a lot of work. Censorship is going to be a big focus for uh, for certain people, and um, there, we know that there are some people in this cabinet or in or, or around this administration for whom that's a huge issue. And um, yeah, I, I I don't know how it's going to work out in the end, but I I, I do know that they are. Uh, it's coming, that there's going to be some kind of effort to take this apart. That's great. I don't know if it means anything at all, but I'm going to take it as a good omen that I was Googling a thing, and Google returned scotthorton.org as one of the results, which I <laughs> haven't seen that happen organically in, in years, you know? And I'm like, wow, I wonder if somebody took the boot off my algorithm's neck there over at google.org, man. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be great. That would be amazing. And you know, I never did ask you if you could look into in your files. Am I in there where they decide I'm not allowed to have any more followers for a year and a half there? And was it the Saudis or the Israelis who screwed me on that or what? Um, I didn't I didn't look, but I, I very much doubt that you're in there because I, I would have had to do a search on you. Oh, you would have had. I see. Yeah, yeah. They, they gave yeah. you what you guys were looking for in the first place within certain parameters and this and that. I yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So. That's but I'll look. Yeah, yeah for sure. Right. Anyway, hey, man, it's always great talking to you. It's always great Absolutely, reading you. Scott. You're one of the greatest journalists and most important journalists in this country. And I like all your opinion stuff and your great podcast and everything. So thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. And, and uh, good luck with the book. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. All right. Take care. All right, you guys. That's great. Matt Taibbi. He is at Racket.News. And uh, America This Week is his show with uh, Walter Kern, too. You guys are going to really like it if you haven't seen it yet. 
the Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.